This is Duke University. We all kind of work together in various ways, and a number of you are actually sitting in the audience who I think participated in, in speculation. So during the Q and A, you can you know, <laughs> offer your responses in addition to me. So okay, but first, let's begin with a print book. So in 2011, a biology postdoc in Michael Eisen's lab at Berkeley tried to buy an out-of-print textbook on fruit flies. Amazon listed 17 copies for sale, ranging from $35.74 to $1,730,045.91 plus $3.99 shipping. So, thinking that this was a joke, uh, Eisen logged in the next day only to find out that the price had actually gone up. Um, there were two multi million dollar copies. So, what Eisen had unwittingly uncovered was the symptoms of an increasingly common practice of algorithmic pricing. So the bookseller ProfNAF had adjusted their price to undercut 40 books by automatically multiplying their stock by 0.9983 times their competitor's asking price. However, it turns out that 40 books had also pitched their price to ProfNAF, setting at 1.27 that seller's asking price. So if 40 books increased their price, so would ProfNAF, and um, you know the cycle would go on setting off a chain reaction <laughs> until a human operator intervened this automated arms race would continue unchecked so this incident not only shows the way in which rogue algorithms can escape human notice to produce you know fairly substantial changes uh, but it also demonstrated how the booksellers themselves were engaged in the process of financial speculation so the reason Morty Books set their price in relation to and slightly higher than ProfNav was likely because they lacked the physical asset itself. So should a consumer choose to buy from them, which they might because that seller was more highly rated, Morty Books would then actually have to first go out and um, buy the book itself from another seller, perhaps ProfNav, in order to actually make a profit. So, Bordy Books wasn't dealing with a physical object as much as speculating on a virtual market. So this example, you know, it's, it produces a kind of humorous microcosm of ultra-fast algorithmic trading. But what happens when it's not entomology textbooks, but financial markets whose rogue algorithms go wild? And last August, this actually happened to Knight Capital, a large brokerage firm. So for 30 minutes, one of Knight's uh, algorithms automatically began buying at the offer price and selling at the, at the bidding price. Knight's automated trading system was not only applying the completely absurd logic of buying high and selling low, but they were doing so at the non-human speed of 2,400 times a minute. So after 30 minutes, Knight lost uh, $400 million and stocks dropped 25%. <laughs> and what these moments reveal are the deeply entangled relationship, the deeply entangled relationship between digital media and finance capital, two virtualizing forces which co-conspire to create a version of capitalism unmoored from physical assets. So the use of technology has accelerated to the point where it's being performed at scales and speed well outside human comprehension. So what does it mean to live in a world where finance moves at these non-human scales? And what role, if any, can games play in helping us to understand this phenomenon? So, enter speculation. 
So this is the financialized context that speculation attempted to address. And last year, I got involved in the design, play, and theorizing of speculation, which was an alternate reality game that was, um, its lead designers were Dukes and Catherine Hales and Patrick Lemieux, as well as Patrick Jagoda at the University of, Ch of Chicago. And many people who are here today, like Luke Caldwell and David Rambo, um, I don't know who else in the audience, it's a little bit dark, were involved in its design. So speculation took place across multiple platforms and media. It's play distributed across both virtual and physical locations. And the game, the, the game the, featured a range of puzzles, challenges, and activities from live performance events uh, that use EEG headsets that measure brain waves. This was uh, Luke's anti-neuromarketing games. <laughs> um, to geocached dead drops in multiple cities to software challenges that tested computer literacy and creative writing exercises. So, for example, there was a there was a, a mini game where the players had to write a history of their play, but they had to do so in the form of an epic poem, so using the conventions of oral epic poetry, which was really, really great. So speculation was played twice. It was played once in April and another time last fall. And the reboot wasn't simply a serial repetition, but it incorporated concepts of seriality, temporal recursion, and feed forward into its gameplay and narrative. So during the second playthrough, this is where my class at Vassar got involved. And we played in conjunction with the students at Duke, University of Waterloo, um, Chicago, as well as the larger ARG community. So what's the premise of speculation? Uh, which is a very hard to describe game. It sort of resists it at, at every level. But in the world of speculation, a global financial collapse has occurred sometime in the near future following the subprime mortgage crisis, the Wall Street bailout, and the emergence of the Occupy movement. The euro has depreciated and the eurozone has collapsed. And an oligarchy of eight co corporations, ominously called Metacorp, bail out the euro, granting them power over the world's monetary system. Out of this consolidation, a rogue algorithm emerges, known only as Nex. This mysterious actor served as the structuring force for much of the gameplay. And so to um, kind of articulate this narrative um, and attract players, the speculation team first released a video, which I realize now I haven't actually hooked up sound. Um, so, is there sound? He's okay. covered. We'll see what happens um, if I just put everything up on maximum. Sorry if it's not super loud. But I'm going to actually play the trailer here. So this was the first rabbit hole that was released. Oh, sorry. Let me try that one more time. My question for you was simple. Were you wrong? Yes. I found a flaw, but I've been very distressed by it. So I don't know if you could hear the back, but on reason just asked, you know, were you wrong? He goes, yes. I found a flaw in the system. All right, so that was the, the first rabbit hole, and that appeared alongside other things like Metacorp business cards. Um, there was a postcard depicting the game's twisting Mobius-like timelines, and even a fistful of Metabucks. And uh, Metabucks were great. They were actually printed on defunct Zimbabwean currency that Kate Hales bought off of eBay. <laughs> and, uh, she repurposed it to, uh, you know, or we repurposed it to emphasize the game's relationship to global circuits of power and abstract markets. And so from these physical and digital portals, 
the players eventually would find their way to speculation.net. So this centralized hub hosted a forum that had tools for playing the various games, software, and this mysterious interface called the Nexus. And this interface featured eight black blank password fields which required players to dive into the strange digital games located within each Nexus. So there's eight Nexus total, eight being an important number to the game's diegesis, both due to its you know, recursive Mobius-like shape, as well as its 8-bit digital logic. So after decrypting the various puzzles that they would be, um, that they would be given, and entering all eight pa passwords within a single nexus, a large red icon accompanying the interface um, would appear, so change the screen. And you know they'd be drawn, or they'd be given this this message that would link to you know the next URL where they could proceed. So the 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 various players who participated in this worked together to solve the challenges in order to kind of move forward in the game. So here's just a real quick example of of one of those challenges. So for example, while searching through the game's source code. Um, they would find a series of passwords. And um, in this particular instance, one, a player would discover um, a website that hosted something that was called, let me show it here, uh, blackswan.exe. So this, is a, this was a mini game that was designed in the idiom of a side-scrolling shooter in which you play a rogue algorithm along the lines of those that infected Knight Capital and the Amazon bookseller. So a Black Swan event, this is a theory, the Black Swan that was made popular from Nassim, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's book Black Swan. A Black Swan event is an unpredictable event that evades explanation. So we don't know and can't know in the present moment why it's happening. So a flash crash, the sudden drop in the market price that is the product of ultra-fast microtrading, is one such black swan event which, due to its speed and scale, cannot be comprehended fully by human actors. So the goal in blackswan.exe is to trade the past for the future. As the player navigates the simulated stock market, data records are produced alongside a series of poetic inscriptions which chart the stock's up and down movement. But, and you can see this here, there's an easy way to win, and that is by crashing the market. Some cheat, I guess. So if you keep the stock depressed at the very bottom of the chart, um, it will continue to generate those poetic records, but not economic growth or fluctuation. And so this is a moment where financial and poetic speculation diverge. And I'll actually return to this point in a bit. But so in blackswan.exe, if you win, whatever that means, you receive the fragment of a URL that leads to a groundbreaking yet underreported study that was done by the University of Miami um, on financial black swans. So in this study, researchers looked at over 18,000 black swan events or flash crashes that took place between 2006 and 2011. And they concluded that while the immediate cause of these miniature flash, flash crashes was unknown, they were not states of exception, but rather the rule of a larger systemic pattern leading to the slow breaking of the economy. So, okay, yeah. Featuring these financial games and, um, actually I'll just go back to that for now. So featuring these financial games and building research into the gameplay, speculation attempted to educate players on the condition of finance capitalism. But it tried to do so using a literary form that mirrored the inscrutable and inaccessible processes of finance capital. And, and this was a really hard game to play. So in the same way Mary Proovy's work, Genres of the Credit Economy, um, which is about 18th and 19th century uh, fiction, ties the rise of fiction and the novel to the rise of paper currency, we tried to think of how digital technologies, contemporary finance, and nonlinear, abstract, and often abstruse transmedial forms mutually inform one another. And the result is a kind of derivative fiction. And this concept of derivative fiction pairs theories like the boards to read with the digital logic of financial derivatives. Derivative fiction begins from the assumption that the economic and the cultural exist in a dynamic feedback loop. 
speculation used, digital technologies, hypertext, locative media, to not only express, but enact the distributed, deterritorialized, and psychopathological conditions of finance capitalism. So the players had to conceptualize the relationship um, of their play to the larger material circuits of global capital, or to use Jonathan Beller's term, the world media system. So from coal tan mines in the Congo, to the factory conditions surrounding the production of computer hardware in China, to data centers and carrier hotels, to ultimately the prodigal return of discarded computer parts to the developing world in the form of e-waste, humans and non-human forms of labor, and the material substrate that structures network cloud computing play, which is normally repressed within the logic of video games, was made to return. And so actually Patrick Lemieux's game, uh, Coin Heaven, that he'll be talking about in the next uh, session, this is another example of a work that tries to figure these, these circuits and these sets of relations. So, as much as this game speculation is about finance capital, it also is finance capital. And Franco Bifo Berardi's description of finance in The Uprising on Poetry and Finance offers a good explanation of why the literary form of the ARG was chosen. So Berardi writes, when you go looking for the financial class, you cannot locate someone to talk to. There are no enemies or poor people to negotiate with, but only mathematical implications, automatic social concatenations. Finance seems inhumane and pitiless because it is not human and therefore has no pity. Those who are involved in the financial game are much more numerous than the property owners of the old bourgeois. They are poor people, workers, pensioners whose futures depend on the fluctuations of the stock market they do not control at all and that they do not even understand. So, as a work of, of network fiction or derivative fiction, speculation attempted to model these inaccessible relations while understanding how imbricated within global financial systems the actions of the players were. By working with ultra-fast algorithmic trading, black swan events, and complex derivatives, the speculation asks the players to think about what it means to live at the mercy of events that take place at the speed of sub-second processor cycles and to engage with non-human microtemporal micro operations that exceed human phenomenology. So the circulation of money has been radically altered and accelerated by computers, but at the same time, this is not necessarily a radical break from the conditions under which money has always operated. Money, on my venture, is the first digital medium. Money, even prior to computers, micro trading, and virtual currencies, you know, from Bitcoin to the hat economy in T Fortress 2, money has always been virtual and based on models of exchange dependent on abstraction and interchangeability. So the fungibility of digital code and fungibility of the money form are kind of cognates of each other. So what's striking about Black Swan EXC, along with speculation to many other challenges that I just don't have time to go into, is the way poetry, computation, and finance, to borrow Ted Nelson's term, are deeply intertwined. And in the uprising, Berardi makes an analogy between the way modernist poetry and subsequently post-structuralist thought uprooted language from a connection to a referent. And he suggests that it's not a coincidence that finance capital, which began to really have a significant economic force, be a significant economic force around the, around the same time as the emergence of modernist poetry. And this, uh, the rise of finance capitalism was you know, very much something that, for example, Keynes disliked um, and actively wrote against. But both of these, uh, so, so the, the rise of finance capitalism enacts a similar gesture by removing any uh, connection to material assets and fortis modes of production. So Berardi writes, money and language have something in common. They are nothing and they move everything. So money and language are an effect of the virtualization of reality. For money, or for Berardi, <laughs> money is the dystopian mirror of utopian philosophies of language and, po and poetry. As he writes, the utopian potential of continental philosophers like Derrida and Deleuze and Guattari is being realized in a nightmarish inversion when their ideas are resituated in the light of finance capital's derealization and dereferentialization. The play of science may yet yield to the emancipation of language but the emancipation of money is a different story. 
So speculation tries to create a game space that locates itself in this dialectic between digital poetics and digitally mediated finance capital. Marx's pejorative term for the credit economy was fictitious capital. And in New Critique of Political Economy, Bernard Schiegler kind of mixes the economic and the ludic, writing that fictitious capital is a pharmacon and more precisely an accounting game. And this accounting game composed of fictitious capital and capitalist fiction is evident on the first page of speculation. Um, so on next, this is in Nexus 1, the game opens with poem, a poem that doubles as a game, a puzzle. And this is the first contribution in a series of hidden fragments from the perspective of someone who invites the player at the end of the poem, which you see here, to call me JP. And in the same way Melville's famous first line, call me Ishmael, signifies an unreliable narrator and irresolvable uncertainty about Ishmael's name and identity, so too does speculation ultimately trouble the uh, identity of this very complex figure. So if it's not immediately obvious, this opening poem is a series of remixed fragments from well-known literary works. The writings of Ellison, Melville, Nabokov, and others have been altered, derived, to reflect the financialized future from which the narrator JP writes to the past. So not only is this passage a derivative fiction in the sense that it's appropriated from a literary canon, but it's explicitly tied to financial derivatives. And um, this, in case not all of us know what financial derivatives are, um, the speculation designers actually offer a definition in a forthcoming essay that they're producing, writing that, quote, a derivative does not take as the object of its trade either good, goods or labor, but instead risk itself. A derivative is essentially a bet on an anticipated price and also a form of insurance that protects a buyer against the risk of market fluctuation. A buyer bets on a possible future in which the price of the asset will rise over time. So financial derivatives have been around for hundreds of years, but it was only starting in the 1990s that the use of derivatives really dramatically increased. And there's three main reasons for this that I won't go into too much detail of, but they were the development of increasingly sophisticated computer technologies to facilitate microtrading, the repeal of Blas Spiegel, and David Lee's discovery of a Gaussian copula formula that involved that allowed investment firms to better calculate complex complex risks on derivatives. So you know, speculation begins with this derivative poem, um, a mix of the economic, the ludic, the digital, and the poetic. Yet as the players began to take more active control of the game. They drifted into more complex forms of exchange. And at the end, many of the players stopped directly engaging, engaging with the challenges, but they actually and, and interpreted them, in fact, as protocols of control, which, which they were. Um, and they turned to more experimental and non teleological forms of play. So memorial pages were made for deceased characters. Critical essays and conversations erupted on the forums. One player began to write palimpsest poetry. Others began trolling to see if they could break the system. Uh, one of my students started to create her own geocache debt drops of important economic and literary documents that ran in parallel with those that were being orchestrated by the lead designers. So Christian Marazzi writes in The Violence of Finance Capitalism that, quote, the abyss opened by derivative financial products seems incommensurable. And the ARG speculation not only tries to make legible what at their core have become an economic black box of inscrutable phenomenon, but it also embraces this liminal poetics of unknowability as a form of resistance. Yet, I think that there's a limit to how far one can take this connection between the literary and the economic, and this is again a point that Berardi makes in the uprising when he writes that the analogy between economy and language should not mislead us. Although money and language have something in common, their destinies do not coincide as language exceeds economic exchange. Poetry is the language of non-exchangeability, the return of infinite hermeneutics, and the return of the sensuous body of language." End quote. So I mentioned earlier the point in the, in the video game Black Swan.exe where you, know, you have to press down and in order to win, just keep pressing down. And this is a point where poetry and the stock market diverge. It's kind of a self-reflexive meditation on what Berardi would call semi-capitalism. But this excess can also be seen in speculation through information overflow that was produced through the players. I'm actually reminded of something that Drew was talking about earlier today about you know, too much meaning being produced. So one of the, the dominant tropes of the game was aquafenia. 
And aquafenia, I don't know if that's a slide, but I do. Aquafenia is the experience of seeing meaningful patterns or connections in random or meaningless data. And this experience, if you've ever played an ARG, is a recurring trait, um, which commonly, uh, which, which is why you commonly see the genre of conspira conspiracy theory being sort of used within the, the, the ARG form. Since ARGs metal epically blur fiction and reality, it's common for ARG players to become paranoid readers of the world. They see patterns and signs everywhere. And speculations players, my students, are no different. These hermeneutics of suspicion were fueled by a desire to predict and manage how the game would unfold. Like a financial derivative, the act of speculation by the players was an attempt to manage risk and uncertainty over the many tricks the game pulled on them. And this, fe this feature isn't actually unique to uh, this particular ARG or ARGs generally. And the game scholar Greg Kostikian has argued that uncertainty is actually um, at the core of what defines contemporary video games. So games, according to Kostikian, premediate our anxieties about the radical contingency contin 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 in which people live. So he writes, we're faced with uncertainty through our lives. Much of our effort is devoted to managing and ameliorating that uncertainty. Is it any wonder then that we have taken this aspect of our lives and transformed it culturally, made a series of elaborate constructs that subject us to uncertainty, but in a fictive and non-threatening way? I'm talking about games, of course. So Kostikian argues for this uncertainty principle by rooting his claim in anthropology and evolutionary biology. But what he doesn't do is think about how the emergence of games right now, in this particular moment, as a, as a it's, it's emerging as a means of managing risk and radical contingency. Um, it's emerging at this moment, um, at this historical moment in time, when you know the sort of psychopathological conditions of contemporary global capitalism are very obvious. So rather than seeing the use of games for managing risk, economic precarity, and psychic fragility as a product of capital, he, I think he takes a more dangerous approach by naturalizing this uncertainty as a universal condition. So just to modify Kostikian's argument slightly, I would suggest that rather than use games to inoculate us against uncertainty, why not create games that denaturalizes and questions the legitimacy of the system? So Berardi never talks about games explicitly, but he does point out indirectly how they can be used as political tools. So he writes, burning a bank is totally useless, as financial power is not in the physical buildings, but in the abstract connections between numbers, algorithms, and information. Therefore, if we want to discover forms of actions which may be able to confront the present form of power, we have to start from the understanding that cognitive labor is the main productive force creating the techno-linguistic automatisms which enable financial speculation. There's some techno-linguistic optimisms from, uh, from speculation. So while there isn't necessarily a direct line from speculation to activist projects like Occupy or the People's Bailout, the game allowed project, uh, players to acknowledge the various forms of virtualized power exerted by finance capital, to learn about the limits of human phenomenology, uh, microtemporality, and to develop a deeper relationship to those techno-linguistic automatisms that govern everyday life. And um, thank you so much. That's it. <laughs> so, um, can you give me you know, the Mobius strip uh, that you saw in the postcards? Speculation never ends, ever. <laughs> it's just in time game design. So it's still going, and here are some cards if anyone wants to check out some of the most recent iterations. If we're going to do Q and A, like anybody who is involved in the game should just come up here with me because it doesn't make sense for me to be stealing any questions. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, do, do players know that it never ends? Like, and if so, what is the appeal of keeping on playing? You want to answer that, Patrick? So it it has endings, right? Like it has it has feelings of culmination because there, like I mentioned at the start, there were eight nexus, and so at the end of that, there would be a kind of terminating point. However, you know, uh, what was it's actually quite uncommon for an ARG to to. 
go for a sequel. And so it wasn't exactly planned that that would happen. And so that started, and then from that, other kind of smaller versions have have kind of it emerged out of that. So. Yeah, I mean, I would say that one of the guiding principles of the design was to try and make an ARG that could repeat. I mean, this is something that was tried, um, uh, I actually forget the name of the ARG, but it, it failed miserably, right? The, the second time just um, didn't work. But speculation, as we kind of came to know it and as it came to be affected by its player base, uh, changes enough such that uh, future iterations always have. Um, enough novelty for old players and new players alike to kind of come back into the fold. And it's also a time traveling narrative. So repetition and change is is uh, part of that genre. And um, those players that are coming back to it are just experiencing like the next loop of uh, whatever diegesis is happening in that sci-fi. So it kind of makes sense with the story for it to be like arrested in this cycle. Yeah. It's um, actually not just time traveling, but it's alternative timelines. In fact, there's eight of them that happen and that all kind of uh, mutually constitute each other as, as the as, as the game evolved. And it had it had a, a, a very it had a narrative that it was really interesting because it was sort of like take a story like House of Leaves. Right, which is itself nonlinear and transmedial and fragmentary. But instead of you know uh, aggregating everything into a codex form, kind of exploded, you know, and, and fragmented across all these different platforms, and then try to reconstruct the narrative from that point of view. And it, it's sort of like adding a, a second order of difficulty to it. But my, you know, uh, that was one of the tasks. That, that was to, we had to take very seriously when, uh, when both playing and, and making the game. And there was a lot of attention to narrative. Um, so, so Paraclass wins that you never step in the same river twice. So I guess this game here, is it sort of, no player will be playing the same game in that that they want to be the same levels. I mean, how is it not going? Is it just nuanced? The same, the same sort of series of levels that are nuanced slightly, or is it just completely different levels for everyone who plays? So that's a good question. It um, again, it's one of the design challenges. How, how do you make a game that functions as a platform that uh, is stable enough that you could, for example, deploy it in a classroom where the creators like aren't teaching the class? But at the same time, how do you keep it engaging and not have you know people be able to Google the answers right away? So it's about balancing those two things. And what we ended up, uh, how we ended up organizing the project was the first couple levels in are in a sense a tutorial, and they're the most static. So returning to the game, um, they're also the most broke. So you can get through them real fast when you come back. Further you get into the speculation arc when it's in like a play session, which it's not right now. I don't think there's anyone playing it currently, but uh, or at least um, there's no community kind of doing it. The further these communities get into it, the more the game levels stop being uh, like linear puzzles to go through and start being like mechanical platform for toys for building stories to share amongst themselves. So at the termination of the game, the players are actually the ones deciding what's happening to characters, or uh, what's happening to plot, or what kind of things they want to do by way of becoming designers in and of themselves. So the game invites players to produce content towards the end, to produce uh, speculations that uh, the designers then respond to, kind of, and alter uh, those narratives in a uh, mass way, once players come up with neat things to do. One of the questions for the game is the amount of time you expect the participants to invest in. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a, a very unrealistic <laughs> goal of ours. KKL uh, estimates that this game takes 100 hours to play. I think that's a low ball estimate. I think it takes a lot of, uh, with the community. I, I was minimally involved in this among standing up here, and so I started starting school here last year, and I was sitting in for the only the first half of a independent study undergrad, basically a playtesting of the first version after it had already been played. 
before they went to their second version. They made a lot of changes, including um, like extrapolating the whole new narrative elements from what were the core monetary characters that I, I had to quit halfway through because I didn't have the time for it. And also because I didn't live in the dorms with these undergrads who would like get together at night and they were all like computer science majors, so they would break all the codes and all that. So but I I would like to hear more about the pedagogical aspect, like to what extent right. do the answer is asking the question. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so like so one of the angles of like tidbits in the editing of volume of capital was to say that um, that like nations engage in financialization and mm -hmm. Calls them pitipidiness, and like that's sort of what academia is mm -hmm. to be. So you're you're inducing this sort of absolutely this you know extrapolation of yeah. giddiness, and to what extent are your students actually able to come away with a better understanding? And then to, to be able to actually self consciously understand their giddiness being indicated within these, these systems. Yeah. So we we actually spent a lot of time thinking about that in the class and and trying to you know. Work through the the fact that you know, we're not just critiquing it, but we're we, we are within this system. And one of the interesting things that, that I found was during the second playthrough. So I, I got contacted by by journalists every now and then to give interviews about about you know speculation playing it. And I would we if it was if it was taking place in particularly if it was local. We would go, I would bring people to my class to these interviews, and so we'd have these group conversations with the journalists. And, and at the all the way to the end, we sounded like crazy people <laughs> trying to actually explain, trying to get to distill what this game is about. If you haven't spent that 100 hours in it, like I had so much anxiety writing this essay because I'm like, how am I going to do this? I probably already went way over. But, <laughs> but just trying to actually um, offer some sort of centered description of what this game was about it was very difficult because once the students were inside, um, they had aquafenia. We'd be walking on the street and they actually had those moments of, are you really messing with us by putting this sign here or is this just a, like a random sign? Like I, that, that happened to them all the time and that happens to ARG players commonly where there's that blurring and you, you know you have that kind of Double vision of, of, of the, the space that you're occupying, but but at the same time it was that not only were they sort of experiencing that, but they it was one of these situations where we all had trouble kind of explaining what it was that we were doing because it made so much sense in the game, and then actually trying to sort of see outside of that, just like we can't see outside of global capital, was an extremely challenging. Can you talk about the like aesthetically the look of the game? I guess usually I don't play any games. <laughs> but like usually interactions with computers, they're they're very clean, they're very sweet, they're very comforting almost that like technology mm -hmm. you interact with. So I'm just wondering like this was very lo fi, very old, very um, abrasive. I just wondered. There was a lot of work in source code that they had to do. There was a lot of work with software tools. You know, like they had to download something and, and work in Audacity or um, what was the game, the, the, black, the other black song, one where you could see the, 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 the Disney, what was the name of that software? Oh. Um, SSTV. Yeah, it was an SSTV. SSTV yeah, it was an SSTV transcoder. Um, I, I think what you're saying though is, um, like early on in the experience of an art, you have to break the mindset that the game is autonomous and different from other parts of the internet. And a lot of digital games are shipped as packages, as apps. Like when you download an app, it's meant to be a, a closed experience. And you're meant to have all the tools within that app to um, play with it or do work with it. Um, so. One of the cool things about the art format is it's uh, transmedial. So you can guide the players to bring in other forms of content. And one of those is like Steph saying, tools. So if we have a uh, uh, just a backwards message, there's no tool within the speculation site. We don't 
package our own tool to reverse that backwards message. And this is one of the first things we tell players to do. Go find a audio program like Audacity, download that. And so from an aesthetic standpoint or like a formal standpoint or even like a composition or theme or style standpoint, you have to take into consideration that kind of fractured um, uh, uh, media. And the fact that Audacity is sitting next to the home page of the site means that you can kind of, or at least as a, an artist and a designer, I embrace the idea that it could be patchwork and it could be quilty. Also, when you're working with over 100 people developing it, including players, people are coming from different spaces aesthetically, formally, uh, even just technically, like what kind of tools they're into. Right. So you can't predict what kinds of things might be asked to be part of the game, or submitted, I should say, as part of the game. No, there's no like uh, asking or, or anything, but players can add things. And so we wanted to produce a aesthetic that would allow for those emergences and additions. And I think that's why you see a lot of um, variation between uh, the different hubs, a lot of, I, I mean, the fonts are all different, uh, the colors are different. There, there are some subtle things that, uh, not subtle, there are some not subtle things like carryover, just like red, for example. Very basic stuff. That we and then the loops game, oh, sorry, sorry. Loops game was yeah. like a specific interaction yeah. where I was supposed to be like, Looking to hire people out. I was I was conducting like some biological research about brain waves and, and they designed the CEG headset thing. So you were you doing like you had the lab coat on? Yeah, I had the time to set for. Um, yeah, there's a wonderful fan screening of who works at it. Yeah, and I mean I think the other thing with the the aesthetic. And they were good about the headsets, yeah. but read their brain waves and I mean. <laughs> well, anything for me. We, my class was reading Catherine Mellis's "What Should We Do with Our Brain" at the time that we were playing uh, this brainwave, brainwave game. So it became a site for talking about, you know, the the deep correlation of the neuronal and the mental and consciousness. And so, you know, we weren't thinking that this is actually measuring it, but it was that was, that was what it was a tool for. And even I mean, running these events, they were pretty funky. I mean. <laughs> but, so part of the aesthetic, I think, was the very short time frame we had for putting this kind of the first round together. Um, we put this together in the first round. Mm -hmm. well, we just started calling it just in time game design because, you know, there was actually a timer running so that would count down to when the next Nexus would be released once it was unlocked. And that timer, we were slaves to that, to that timer. Yeah, oh. if, you, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if you miss the timer, for example, and the players have an expectation of a pattern, then you have to come up with a diegetic reason that that timer was broken, right? So adjusting the plot around mishaps is also added, I think, to that aesthetic of fragmented or fractured um, thing. And all the, techno all the technological metaphors and GUI metaphors we were using were uh, Telematic, long distance, and broken. So it was both the time travel mechanism as a kind of phone call from far away, as well as the websites you were reading, since they are kind of like 12 monkeys or something. They're coming from this other place where technology may not still have the same of aesthetic privileges, I guess, or, or styles. And, and also, like again, looking at academic writing, like they had to pour through, like that that uh, article on flash crashes. You know, they didn't just have to read it, but there were actually puzzles and codes that we added into the documents. So, you know, it became it, that became a academic discourse became a platform for game design. You know, so, um, you uh, just from uh, like an academic transfer standpoint, like what did like, what did your students take away from the game? Like, what did you test? Like, did you look at at the end of the semester what they were learning, or how did you look at, like, okay, we're playing a game. Now that we're not playing the game, this is what we know. So I try to avoid metrics as much as possible, but I can tell you anecdotally. When we started, they never heard the word both the class and trading. They never heard the word derivative before. Um, they never knew the conventions about this poetry, and when we Ended. It really, really did. <laughs> I, I mean, I would say it, it really depended what people got into. Yeah. Because there were core groups of people who would, I 
as soon as the next is opened up, they would go out with all the codes. They wouldn't yeah. read the flash graphs as say, they would look right. just scan it for the code. Uh, and that's all. There were other people who basically dug into the narrative and exclusively um, because they didn't get all the public stuff. But all, all of my students had to go into source code. They had to do you know view source, which again, if it, I always do a show of hands in my class, like how many of you have ever looked at source code and before? And it usually, I'm, I'm lucky if it's over 50%, right? Um, so that's well, that something that we have to do. Computer literacy, just even on yeah. a minimal level, was something that they that they got over, apart from some of these larger kind of economic and aesthetic things. Sorry, Well, I was going to say, like, you, you teach um, electronic literature and uh, hypertext fiction. So a lot of the um, beats we were taking as far as uh, delivering this content was taken from those authors. Mm -hmm. So it fit into her course pretty uh, explicitly. I will say, though, that um, I think uh, as designers, we really had to adjust our expectations because we did do a lot of research in the history of natural currency, the uh, uh, the actual physics of flash crashes, and um, this type of content was not consumed in a way that was obviously uh, useful. So, for example, the best ex uh, the best example is um, uh, Nick Gessler worked uh, really hard on building these uh, naturalization of currency modules, and we found out about halfway through the game that players were just juicing the files, juicing the EXEs for uh, text and images. Rather than playing through them, they'd run them through like a set of processes that would decouple all the content from the executable file, so they could just read through like a list of oh, these are all the images, and they could look at them and find the final code, and then be done with it. So they're them, le learning more about hacking executables than, than actually all this rich historical content that Nick was building in. And so it seemed to me that the for some of the players, the uh, uh, financial histories became a context for game design lessons. And so thinking in terms of how this became a platform for making new games, I think uh, there are a good subset of players who um, maybe not knowing it, or maybe we didn't know we were teaching it, but learned some, some I think, really important lessons about how to make and play games. And, and Nick? Yeah, he did get back at them. He, um, in the next version, he did a very intense um, encryption on the data that uh, would display different textual information because it was uh, like a visionaire cipher or something. So the players would juice it and then they hit dead ends in the game space. Well, he left, he left a fake URL in there. Right. That if they juiced the file, they would get the fake ones, but encrypted all the real data. And, so, and those dead ends, uh, the real data. Yeah, and all those dead ends accuse them of being liars and traitors. It was a teaching moment. I think you had your head in So, um, has anyone on Wall Street tried to hire you yet? Create a game for traitors? I'll send them my things. I remember asking Patrick to go to that. Well, he, yeah, he, he wasn't he, crushed, right? One of the things that he actually has gone to conference with is that military. Right. I can't remember the one, but like that was Naval War College. Right? Yeah. So he's had more direct interaction with, with the military. Um, I don't know if that would actually apply directly to the Yeah, It might be more. Well, and this is a this is actually a really fascinating question because the the question you ask at the end of an arc is, okay, now that we're done playing it, what movie is coming out based on this? Right? Like, what what's this an advertising for? An advertisement for? And our players said things like that when the game ended. Like, a lot of them were not students and not engaged and didn't know what it was. A lot of uh, weirdly catered to high schoolers were playing it. So uh, <laughs> it's our typical thing. Yeah, but. <laughs> The fact that this is an ARG that isn't designed as an advertisement, I think, sets it apart from a lot of the history of type of media. And the fact that it doesn't conclude with um, with a trailer or some kind of resolve, uh, we were 
reading uh, Infinite Jest at the time when we made this. So like <laughs> making sure that the game kind of crashed at the yeah. end with no result was really important to us. But, but that was the exact opposite of, of the experience of even most seasoned art players who, yeah. who play these for fun uh, week to week. So. You know, reading Finnegan's Wake or Infinite Jest, I don't know if I call that fun. And, and so the fact that we conflate an ARG or a video game with fun, we didn't really begin with that. That assumption. So, but had a level of difficulty that wasn't an anxiety or, or a problem. And there were lots of modules that we had to sacrifice the fun to actually progress yeah. at all, like putting the cursor over at the bottom of the flash cross game. That just was not fun. Or like, some of the overly <laughs> didactic modules just weren't really fun, which is why the players were kind of just cheap at. So in some senses, it's like a counter narrative, but also counter game design. Like, doesn't reward the same type of activity that you would expect. And we use that as a commentary on gaming the system in terms of Wall Street trading. So speaking of nonlinear temporality, I have no idea how long we've been standing here. Um, so, so maybe one last question, and then that we'll would be great. And if, and if Patrick goes tonight, I think we'll have some some so overlapping you questions. Your, your hand up. Yeah, uh, a point about the aesthetics. Back to that. Uh, it strikes me that this kind of uh, using the source code and having this kind of wild and woolly interface uh, is a kind of alternative uh, representation of networks to, say, the nice elegant line. Uh, you're showing networks with gaps and holes and violent crashes and all kinds of other things. Did you guys want to maybe say a word about that? You know, as much as data visualization is supposed to be present things, it also represses and makes it visible mm -hmm. a lot. And that's actually something Eric Monson was, was talking about earlier, very earlier, earlier this morning. And you know, so for us too, um, something that that was really important to talk about were these, you know, th these larger networks, these larger circuits of global capital, like I mentioned, and you can even see on the the, the, the postcards I got handed out, it's a cold hand comment. You know, we were thinking about the fact that we were using digital technologies, like where does my computer come from, right? Like what are those material circuits? You know, we're creating these narratives, but we're also using these technologies that are, you know, forming content or in a kind of feedback loop with each other. So we were really thinking about those kinds of networks, both of human and non-human labor, so from the coal town to the factories in China, to the software developers in Silicon Valley, you know, to the players, the user-generated uh, content, or I think as Peter Kraft has said, user-generated content, <laughs> um, you know, and to, to all the kind of messiness of the world, and ending, culminating with e-waste. Uh, and so this was like part of not only the narrative, but part of, you know, everything that we were doing. And it wasn't just representing, but it was enacting, again, these processes of capital. And that was a really important sort of mode of visualization or anti-visualization. Right. I don't know what you want to call it, but, right. but that, was really, that was really important to the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank Fantastic. You so Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.